Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all its stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about Amen. We uh, imported a country western singer all the way from uh, uh, Park or Nashville. There you go. I knew it was a good word. Oh my. I'm Pastor Mark along with the praise team and each and every one of you. It's our joy and our privilege to worship together. This is, if you're watching online at least, Chancellor Reformed Church, and we are unashamedly gospel proponents. We have good news, and uh, as the team saying. We believe Jesus changes people's lives, and we are evidence of it. So let people understand that we're sinners, but we're sinners that are saved by grace. We understand that we get to be worshipers. Let's see if I want to go back. So we want Jesus to change lives, and we'll talk about that today. And then the word hallelujah literally means praise Jehovah, praise God. And this is the time where we get to do that corporately. 
we're also private worshipers, right, over the course of the week. And when we see the things that God does, we can't wait to get together. Even in a wheelchair, Kay Plucker, and oh my, oh my. But we want to be together to be God's people to give Him praise and glory. So, if you're a guest with us today, or if you're watching online, fill one of these out. Let me know how it is that we can come alongside you, how we can pray for you. We have some books uh, available, Bibles that we can give away, and we're just desirous of doing that as well. Also, if you have any questions, as we go through the sermon uh, this morning, you have questions. Uh, it's a two-parter, so I can answer some of those next week. Write that down on the card, and then just hand it to me after the service, and I'll make sure that we incorporate those things in as well. So, to the family of God, guests, Cheryl, good to have you back with us. Uh, folks that went through funerals for mom, funeral for Jeb Ford, all of that stuff. We bring it here, and we just say, God be with us. Help us to focus on you and to worship, because you indeed are worthy. That's the song we're going to end the service with. He's worthy. So let's pray together, shall we? Oh God, lover of humanity, we come to worship you this morning and to give you thanks for creating us and letting us have the awesome privilege of being known by you and knowing you. Pour out your spirit on us. Inspire us to sing your praise in this land and every land, with this our church family and with every generation. We seek to exalt your name from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets in Christ. Amen and amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to each of you. For it comes to us from God our Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to Him. Amen and amen. We're going to worship as we stand and sing this next song. Just an invitation for children at least. There are children's bulletins on the back table. If you want to get one of those right now, you can do that. Otherwise, let's all stand and sing together. Uh, before, yeah, stand. Uh, do that. But just like last week, the Word of God is, we are people of the book because the book tells us about Jesus, right? But this morning, as we prepare our hearts for this next song, we're going to read the next few slides together in unison. And as we did, we're going to read the text as well as the reference, all right? So God's people reading just to get this in our heads, in our hearts, and it'll allow us to sing. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Psalm 90, 14. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Psalm 96, 1. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Psalm 98 and 1. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Psalm 104, 33. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, 1. And on that, we'll sing.
and be seated, shouting out his praise. We're going to move into a time of, of prayer, and we're going to use the Acts model. I did this uh, last week with our uh, junior high Sunday school class, and uh, we talked about uh, the Lord's Prayer, but also how is it that we can pray during the course of the week. And one of the models, that's all it is, just suggestions, would be to do the ACTS. So there's adoration, which we'll start with. We'll move into confession, some silent time. We'll move into then the time of thanksgiving, and uh, then supplications, which are the petitions, praying for ourselves, for others, that sort of a thing. So recognizing that uh, our God, we want to sing out his praise. We want to shout out, we're here together as God's people. So again, I want you to be comfortable, hear me, but if the Holy Spirit comes and somebody needs to, 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 to pray out loud other than me, know that I'm open to that, hear me, and uh, we'll just do things decently and in good order, but we'll give the Spirit of God room to move. So we're going to start in prayer, and again, know that you have the freedom, right? If you want to kneel and use your pew as a kneeling bench and turn around, you want to stand to stay awake, that's all right. Um, we're going to pray. We shout out your praise. We pray out your praise. We, we think on these things. We declare them before the Lord. So start with me, if you would. So God, we give you thanks that your Spirit has called us to this place. We give you thanks that we get to be uh, Bible-believing Christians who understand the joy of the Lord. Uh, Bible-believing Christians who know what it is like to do what Scripture encourages us to do, to get together, to um, kind of like a spark or an ember with another ember. We get to, 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 to kind of help light the fire and to let others know that that which they believe is what we also believe believe, and it's encouraging to us, especially in these times. But uh, Father, we just want to start by saying we are so glad that we get to praise you. Your loving kindness is better than life. We give you thanks that you are a loving Father, and that your heart's desire is to be in relationship with us. And so we thank you again for the joy that's ours in adoring you and exalting you and saying we recognize all of your attributes, your faithfulness, your goodness, your loving kindness, the, the saving heart that you have, the, the fact that you are a providential God, that you are sovereign. All of these things just make us stand in awe. We marvel at your goodness. We, uh, we're in awe of your attributes, and we adore you. And being in your presence, like Isaiah chapter 6, we recognize suddenly that while the glory of the Lord fills the temple, as Isaiah has that vision, he recognizes that he is sinned with his mouth. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And so we move into this time of confession, and again, as the Holy Spirit moves, as he brings things to light in each of our hearts, we want to be open to his moving. We want to be open to his saying to us, my child, confess that before the Father. Don't let it stand in the way between you and him. Don't let it stand in the way between you and in others with the relationship. And so, Spirit of the living God, Hear us as we move into this time of silent confession because we want to be right with you through Jesus Christ. And again, Jesus, we recognize the price that you paid for our sins. Sometimes we think it's so easy to confess, and, and yet we want to be reminded again that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. And we thank you for that gift. 
we move into that time of thanksgiving, the, the, we, we say thanks again for bringing us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. We thank you again for forgiving us, for giving us the word that says that you are faithful and just and you will forgive us if we confess with our heart, with our mind, with our tongue. And as far as the east is from the west, so far do you remove our transgressions from us. Thanks be to God. Thanks for the people that we're sitting beside and around. Thank you for the history of this congregation. Thank you for the church and the world. Thank you for missionaries who are proclaiming the good news that Jesus can change lives. We give you thanks for life and for breath. We give you thanks again for sustaining us over the course of these days since we've been apart from each other. Some have buried a mother, some have buried a friend. Some have had uh, some trying times physically. And yet we've also been at, with, with people where we've been encouraged. We got to open up mail from people in this congregation and, and read it to folks and just to say, see, you've been thought of, you've been blessed. A phone call, a text. God, we thank you again for the fact that your love lives in us and that not only do we say we love God, but we do love others. Thanks be to God. Our list of thanks for all of the things that you've done from not only the beginning of history and creation to meeting us where we're at even now and for sustaining us and for giving us grace, for helping us with the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that we would have the fruit even of that Spirit, being loving and joyful, bringing peace into situations giving us patience, kindness, and goodness, faithfulness, helping us to practice self-control, young or old. Thanks, God, for your investment in our lives, which happens every moment. To you be praise and glory. So we've adored, we've confessed, we give thanks. And now we make our supplications, our, our petitions. We raise folks to the throne of grace. Let me just pause here. People of God, you can look at the screen now for a moment. Here are some folks that are, 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 are listed, and I just want you to take one of those. Ask God how it is that you should pray. And then pray for a person or for a group of people. Pray for our missionaries, whatever it may be. Pour out your heart to God with your passion. What's important to you? Who is important to you? Bring that one person, bring that situation now before the Father who loves to hear. In silence, petition Him. Again, Lord, we recognize that uh, Cheryl McNelly is back with us. We thank you for Ron Dykstra. Think of David and Rachel, and again, Kathy and I, there's been going to glory around all of us. And we would pray for siblings or for our children or the next generations. Let it be that they would come to not only a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, but that they too would be able to pray and to praise in the midst of these circumstances in life. I think of Kay and the, the tumble that she took and just pray for, for healing. We think of Elaine and her, her, her hip and uh, just being able to walk. We think of Viral and stomach issues. We think of all of the folks that are just so near and dear to us. We love them. We think of Jaretta's heart and Larry Hogestrot's heart. They so want to be with us in worship and we would love that. But we love them now from a distance, and we ask again for wisdom. We ask for families that are taken care of. Thank you for therapists. Thank you for all of those that safely travel to Lemon 
and back. Thank you that we have a volunteer fire department. We lift them up to you. We ask that you would continue to provide safety for them, for first responders, for others. And God, there's nothing wrong with praying for ourselves. And so we spend just a closing moment saying, Lord, here I am. Hear my prayer for me. And so all of this we pray and we say to you be the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. And God's people said, amen and amen. You understand the awesome privilege? So many of us have gone through death these past few weeks. I had a conversation with a person yesterday just to say, how is it that people who have no hope about tomorrow, how do they get through this when it's as difficult as it is for us who love Jesus, whom Jesus loves? And that's why we remind one another again, brothers and sisters, when we have anything to praise him for, when we have anything to petition him for, let's run to our dad. He loves to hear. His hands are outstretched. Come, bring it to the Father.
Thanks, team, for being sensitive. Recognizing we've got uh, a lot of pew space, we've got a baptism going on, and I think that probably took 35 families from the church. No, I have no idea, but it, uh, a lot of folks there, uh, folks in Arizona, folks... Uh, so, because we've got a bit of a family feeling here right now, I'm just going to pause and say, as we were praying, is there something that needs to be shared with the whole body? So did you get a, a verse of Scripture? Was there something that the Lord spoke to you in particular that would be of encouragement to the body of Christ? Just to make sure, again, not awkward for me at all, not awkward for you. So that piece of adoration, that just busted through right there at the beginning of that prayer. To think of all that God is, no matter what we face, somehow we let our problems become greater than the one who is the greatest. Right? Problems become smaller in the presence of the one. That's Otherwise, let me know after the service and we'll speak into it and we'll see how it goes. So thanks. God be praised. All right. We had uh, our consistory meeting, our leadership team, and uh, from uh, the voting, uh, Leon Clock is our vice president, David Larson is our clerk, Terry is our deacon chairperson, and Jamie is our treasurer. So just letting you know, those are folks as long as uh, we also have other leadership team members, but you can come to them any time. So thanks for their willingness to fill those offices. Ladies, uh, Audrey and Glenn are playing Baptist this morning, she said. She came yesterday to the office, and, uh, but uh, Tuesday we'll be here in the afternoon for, I think it's almost your last study. So well done, 31 chapters in the story. And uh, you're going to touch on some topics that we'll be dealing with today and next week. So thanks for being students of the Word. Today is the uh, third Sunday, and so if you uh, are inclined at least, you can use an envelope in the pew. Otherwise, if you brought one uh, in your boxes too, there's a special building fund envelope, and feel free to use those things there. So how do people give? People give through the building fund. People give financially, which is just a wonderful thing. People give, uh, again, here through socks, underwear. I brought two small boxes away to church on the street. Um, we, uh, Cheryl had given another whole bag of, uh, oh, I don't know, toothpaste and shampoos and all that stuff while she was down south, and so we're just grateful for the way that you supply that. We give through uh, letting kids know that we encourage them. So I think we walked past 77 bags this past week. A few more were put out on Wednesday. And uh, so if you have a note or a Bible verse or just uh, want to fill in one thing for one person, whatever it might be, feel free to do that through this month of February. Uh, people give by being chaperones and coming alongside students and listening and leading, and we're grateful for that. Folks come and they give by being students. If there were no students, there would be no teachers. And we're just grateful. Which reminds me, uh, adult uh, Sunday school, 11 o'clock here, I'm going to start and we're just going to explore church membership. So there are oh, probably eight or nine emails that went out this past week to folks that said, I'd like to explore what this could be. And so that'll happen here at 11 o'clock. If you're interested, again, no pressure exploring what it looks like to become a member of the fellowship of Jesus Christ. So that's there too. And then uh, you'll see this for the next two weeks, World Day of Prayer, 2nd Lennox. And uh, 10 o'clock will be the service component. And I think, Kathy, your sister is going to share, right? Yeah, that'll be a wonderful time together. So blank. Brad, have you been playing with the uh, PowerPoint this morning? He's been playing with it. Gary, now that you say that, he brought this this morning. At first, I thought it was a piece of something that came out of the back end of a cow. And then I smelled it, and it's burned, and I knew right away. I knew right away. Sorry, dear, this was PM's idea. Not my fault. I'm going, was there some kind of an explosion? What is this? Ay, ay, ay. And he says he can bake. 
Ron, only because I don't trust your son. Not, it has nothing to do with your character, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give this to you. If you're brave enough to eat it, then I know that there's not like chocolate x slacks in there or something else that he's done. <laughs> no, see? Yeah. <laughs> I knew there was something un untrustworthy fellow. Oh, my. But what a hoot this was. We asked him to do it. Carlene, what did he do? He brought 20 dozen flowers. Oh, <laughs> I think it's time to pray again. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. Oh. We're going to come to the Word. Let's pray together. God, whom we know through the Scriptures and creation, speak to us in this hour. Show us the wisdom and joy of your ways that we may know what is good and do what is right through Jesus Christ, your Word. Amen and amen. Thanks be to God. Yeah. I believe that there are many people in the world that believe in heaven. I also believe that there are many people in the world who believe in hell. But I also believe, and I know this to be the case with conversations with folks, that there are indeed people who don't want to think about hell. They're willing to gamble about tomorrow or even today. There are folks who don't want to think about hell and who mentally, indeed, make it go away. So they've created some things. Again, I have here a variety of books which you can borrow after next week, but uh, Hell on Trial, Erasing Hell, Evil and the Justice of God, Heaven, Hell, and Purgatory, uh, the Bible about the life hereafter, they contain things like um, a study about people who, because they don't want to believe in hell, have created something which we would call Universalism, right? The church in Sioux Falls on Cliff Street. What, what do they believe? Well, a universalist believes that people, no matter if they're good or if they're bad, ultimately, universally, they will be saved. They will go to heaven. A universalist. So this thought of putting behind them something which the Scripture teaches about the afterlife, about hell, they don't want to face it. They say that hell was created for the devil and the demons, which, by the way, is true, that piece. But based on that particular verse, which we'll see in a bit, they say nobody else can go to hell. Universalism. Then there are folks who've created this construct called annihilationism. Annihilationism. These are people who believe that once a person dies, so physically they've, they've breathed their last, that their physical body and some purport that there might not be souls or spirits, but if they say yes, that both your body and your soul just go out of existence, that on the last breath, there is nothing thereafter. It just goes out of existence. Now, again, there are other thoughts, many of those. There are the persons who say that the world is constantly getting better and better. Look at how it is that we're finding cures and vaccines, be it for, for polio or for other sorts of things like that, uh, uh, computers and technology, and then people, people getting better. We're more alert, more wise, all of that kind of stuff. And they would say, it's pretty old-fashioned to believe about hell. 
And then there's the whole group. And, and, and again, I, I realize you and I are living in the midst of this, right? What happens when we start living in a culture that, that basically says um, there are no consequences for doing your own thing? So from gender dysphoria to, uh, I mean... You can do whatever you want short of maybe murder and short of maybe pedophiles. But the consequences are for sin. Nobody raises an eyebrow anymore about divorce. Nobody raises an eyebrow anymore about, about living common law. Nobody raises an eye anymore about all of that kind of stuff. And because all of the, 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 the people who kind of would look over their nose to say, do you see how all of this is affecting the world? All of that stuff is going down, down, down. And so a lot of folks believe that even though they actively sin, there are not going to be any consequences for it. Whew. Those are all things that are challenging us in this world. Alongside people who just don't believe that there is a hell... And I've spoken to folks who believe that if they're just good, not bad, but if they're just good, that God owes it to them to go to heaven. So here we are in this series, and it is so applicable to where we are today. I thank God for His Word, along with you. Because today there's a topic right in the midst of our text where we're studying. So if you want to, you can follow it. I will put a verse or two up on the screen. But uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, again, uh, all five chapters of 1 Thessalonians speak of the coming of, of Christ. And then here we move into chapter 1 of 2 Thessalonians, talks about the coming of Christ. And then we move in two or three weeks into chapter 2, the man of lawlessness or the antichrist or the beast. And that's got something to do with hell. Chapter 3 has got something to do about how we should live now to be servants of Christ, to be people who show the love of Christ. But right here in this first chapter, embedded in some verses are some thoughts that we're going to have to talk about. One of those I hope to do next week with you, and we'll see what the text says, shall we? So last week we said that because Christians were being persecuted, were being afflicted, like is happening right now, right? In Nigeria, in North Korea, in China, as nice as the Olympics are, <laughs> folks are being persecuted for being followers of Jesus. And so... Paul tells us this truth, eternal truth, about Scripture. God will repay with affliction an eye for an eye, so to speak. People who are killing Christians will be held accountable. That's one. Then he says, I will give relief to the afflicted. So to those of us who are living Christ like lives through the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're going through, be it people making fun of us, people shunning us, people trying to shut us down, whatever it might be, when Jesus is revealed from heaven, something magnificent is going to happen. And so we recognize that while we're struggling, there's something that makes it worth it all. Well, look at that. And then finally, last week, we said, Jesus, uh, he will be judge. Retribution is his. And so here's where we went. Well, uh, let's stop there. Retribution is his. So in our text, verses 5 through 12, there's that little phrase in 7 and 8 that says, God is going to send his son, Jesus Christ, the second coming. That's what we're looking at this whole series. And when Christ comes again, he's going to judge those who have afflicted. He's going to help bring relief to those who have suffered in his name. But he's also going to judge. And it has two kind of groups of folks in there. 
We'll deal with one today. We'll deal with the other next week. And that's the question I'll tell you right now. What are you going to do? What is God going to do with the people who've never heard of Jesus? That's hinted at in our text today. But let's go here first. Let's understand this absolute truth, right? John 3.16. Remember the football game? And we saw it a few times. We even saw it at the Olympics if you watched that one, one or two times, which was really interesting. John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not... What's that next word? Perish. So in this most famous verse, probably this in like Psalm 23 in the whole Bible, everybody who believes in him, well, God is a God of love. God wants to save people, which he does, and that's true. God is a God of love. But there's something in this verse that says, hold on, you got to think about this. Will not perish. What does God have to save us from? If, 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 if Jesus doesn't do something, where will we perish? What do people need rescuing from? What do you and I need rescuing from? Oh, it's true, ourselves. But in this context of our verse, might I suggest to you at least, what do you need rescuing from? Shall not perish, shall not be bound for hell. We need to be rescued from not only the kingdom of darkness, but from what could happen in life afterwards for us, for all who are not in Jesus Christ. Whew. We need to be rescued from a place that is real. <laughs> Let's go there, shall we? So our text says, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, we can unpack that. It's a magnificent scene. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, chapter 5. It's authoritative. It's declarative. It's not secret. It's, it's for the whole world to know. Flaming fire is the sense of both judgment and of cleansing, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel. There is a reckoning that's going to happen. And I want to make sure that we understand that and that we're comforted by that reckoning. These will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. That's why Jesus says, <laughs> John's gospel, right? Shall not perish, shall not have the punishment of eternal destruction. When I say white, you say black. When I say good, you say evil. When I say heaven, you say hell. Yes. That's what we're talking through today. Who would know better about it than the one who preached the most on this topic than any other topic in the Bible? Sounds strange to us, doesn't it? Jesus was a brimstone preacher. Can I say it that way? Oh, just from Matthew's gospel, and then I did not pick them all, but just to give you a little taste, here are four or five quotes from Jesus, Matthew's gospel, right? Look at the end of verse 22. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in the danger of the fire of hell. That's Jesus, right? Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. It's better that one of your members that you lose them than that your whole body be thrown into hell. That's Jesus again, right? Don't be afraid of those, but be afraid of the one who can kill both soul and body in hell. Again, that's Jesus. And you, Capernaum, here he is talking about uh, this judgment that had come upon Sodom and Gomorrah, and he says, I tell you, it'll be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. What judgment? judgment of doing your own thing, of being a make-believe follower of God. I mean, we can unpack all of that. 
Here Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and to the scribes, right? And you read in Matthew's account, it's like Jesus is just attacking religious leaders who play the game, who have no personal relationship with Jesus, but want to put all of these rules on people to say, you got to do this, you can't do that, you better do this. And they want to lift themselves up into some lofty position. They want you to honor them. And Jesus calls them. He says, on the outside, you guys look like you're white, fresh, lime painting, but on the inside, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced? He's talking to religious leaders. Whoa. You can read from the Old Testament descriptions about hell, eternal punishment in Ezekiel, in Isaiah, to where we go to the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, where we go to Paul's writings, his letters, all the way to the book of Revelation. Here is a list of descriptive words. Or kids in school, these are called adjectives. I don't think there's a parent here who looks at that list and says, oh, that's a wonderful place. I want to make sure that I and my children go there. Why did Jesus preach about it so much? Why did he warn so many people? Is it because he has a loving heart? Because he understands the eternal consequences? Some people say, oh, this Jesus, all he did was try to scare people into the kingdom. And I'm just going, (laughs) work for me. It's not the only reason, but consider the alternative. Wow. In the Old Testament, if you should do a, a, a book study, so our, our class on Wednesday night, we used the concordance and we looked up different words, but you look up, uh, say, in the ESV study Bible, right? 80,000 footnotes and everything else has a beautiful appendix in the back of it. You look up what's the, 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 the terminology that's used in the Bible. Basically, you'll find three main words, right? So Sheol, which we would have the, the, the Hebrew word, it's used in the Psalms, it's used when it describes somebody's passing as, as, as the grave. It's just, again, the Bible at the very beginning, it gives us some revelation on God's heart, His plan, on people staying in connection with Him. But slowly but surely, as the 66 books start to unravel, and we find this theme, Sheol becomes Hades. Hades becomes or is, is, is expanded to become what we would call hell. Or as Jesus described it, he used the word Gehenna. So here, right, Matthew 5. One of your members perish then for your whole body to be cast into hell. So you go to the Bible, the original, the Greek, and the word is Gehenna. What is that? Just outside on the southwest corner, I think, southeast corner of Jerusalem, there's a valley. And in the Old Testament, you have stories of kings who did bad things who did not serve the Lord their God. I'm thinking of somebody like King Ahaz. And there was this huge foreign god named Molech, M-O-L-E-C-H. And he was this huge statue with arms that were like a slide with a big hole in his belly on which the king actually put one of his children so that they would be incinerated. An absolute abomination in the face of God. Slowly but surely, that valley that uh, became what we would call the garbage dump. People would take their stuff and throw it over the wall, or they would walk it there, take their donkey, bring out the family trash, and slowly but surely, this place became known as a stinking, worm-filled, always-on-fire, smoky kind of a place. And Jesus basically says, if you want to know what hell is like, think of Gehenna. Think of the garbage dump. Now, I'll be careful, hopefully, with my words. 
hell, the eternal garbage dump, was created for the devil and all of those who followed him, right? All the demons. But could it be that because Satan, you can go through Isaiah, what, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, look at different passages of Scripture that describe how it is that Satan had pride in his heart and he wanted the worship that was given to God to be to him. And so he thought he was even loftier or higher than God. And ultimately, there's a war in heaven, Revelation chapter 12, one third of the heavenly host is kicked out. And what happens? Satan has always been on the move to go after Christ, and if not Christ, then to go after Christ's children, the church. And ultimately, ultimately, and we'll answer one of the questions I think you'll have next week, this place prepared for the devil and his angels because they revolted, they rebelled, they wanted to place themselves higher than God. So then one of the questions that we have is, will there be anybody else there? Who else has rebelled? Who else has sinned? Who else has placed themselves higher than God? Who are the people who who, who thumbed their noses at God saying, I'll do it my way? Is rebellion the thing? All I can say to you, brothers and sisters, regarding... H-E-L-L, H-E double hockey sticks. Hell is real. I can tell you that hell is horrible. Eternal punishment over and over, phrase after phrase, reference after reference. Any sin, every sin, creates a road that arrives at hell. Ooh, I let that sink in. <laughs> Thanks. Perfect timing. Why? Because it doesn't have to be this way, right? I'm not here to rain on anybody's parade. I'm here to bring up the Word of God to say, this is what Christ teaches, and where are you today? Where am I? I want to teach about hell. Why? Because hell helps us to understand the goodness of heaven. I think that sometimes people don't like to think about heaven because you're thinking you're going to be sitting on some cloud playing a harp, and who wants to go there anyway? That's why in the next few weeks I want to let you know about all of the truths that Scripture gives us regarding heaven and what a wonderful place it is. That song that we learned when we were kids, heaven is a wonderful place filled with with glory and grace. I'm going to see my Savior's face because heaven is a wonderful place. I want to be there. You guys want to sing it as a round? You want to do that? No. There is just so much to unpack about heaven, but we also need to understand this side. And this side helps us to know how great that side is. Wow. So the good news is Christ has conquered sin, he's conquered death, he's conquered Hades, Sheol, Gehenna, hell. And I'm here to say that for those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, as it's described in the book of Revelation, right? To all who, what? What do you need to know? How must I be saved, says the jailer in the book of Acts? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That belief that changes how it is that you live. You let him be Savior and Lord of your life. And if your name is written in the book of life, you'll have no fear of this terrible fate of hell. Why? Because we've been destined to live eternally. Thanks be to God. One of these books, Jerry says, you can deny that heaven and hell are real, but you can't rationally be indifferent about the matter. Given what is at stake, the only sensible attitude is to care and to care deeply. Maybe it shocks us. Maybe it, 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 it moves us to understand the consequences of sin. 
Maybe it, 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 it helps us to ask the Spirit of God to help us to live more like His Son, which is what He's about. That's what He's doing in our lives, right? Sanctification. Hopefully it makes us think of sin and the utter despicableness of it so that we would do what Scripture says, right? Resist the devil. How? Flee. Don't dabble with him. That's why we live John 3.16. That's why this church... We have as our mission statement, right? We, Chancellor Reformed Church, have a great commitment because God is great for us, right? We have a great commitment to living the great commandment, to loving Him with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, for, for, for adoring Him for all of His attributes, for thanking Him for saving us, for moving in our lives, for calling us to be His children, and that is what we are, as John tells us over and over again in the epistles, right? First, second, and third. Oh, my. The good news, the gospel is God so loving that he gave his son. What will you do with Jesus? Whoever believes shouldn't perish. Oh, thank you, God. Thanks for calling me out of the kingdom into your most marvelous light. How can I say thanks? But not only does it help us to worship But it also gives us this, Ron Peterson in his book, may God start to be faithful to him and to our fellow human beings who need to know him and the one who died to redeem sinners from hell. Right? Left on our own without Jesus, every one of us is going to that place. Oh, that we would recognize that we're not bound there, but we'll be with him forever in paradise, like the thief on the cross. And as we find ourselves looking towards that heaven, we praise and we worship, but we also fill in the second part of that mission statement. Chancellor Reformed Church has a great commitment to the great commandment. We want to love Jesus and say thanks, but we also want to love our neighbor as ourselves. We don't want to go to hell. We don't want them to either. So we do what? The Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded. You know the stuff. You've been Bible believers for years, decades, some of you. Who are we raising up? Who are we teaching? Who are we sharing the good news of? How are we living as a, as a teacher in a classroom that just kids make fun of and all? Your reward will be great in heaven, quoting the Lord. That we have a passion, a desire to make sure that others know the good news of Jesus and that they don't have to go there. Part two next week. Is this bad news? No, it's not. It's good news. It's good news. We have the team come up, and as they do, why is it good news? Because we're going to end with a song that's titled, Is He Worthy? The one who was spat upon, the one who was despised, the one who was rejected, the one who was uh, pushed down with a crown of thorns, the one who bled on our behalf, the one who cries out, Father, forgive! That's us as he prays for us. And at the very end, it's finished. This one who calls us in, is he worthy? Absolutely. So, Father, thanks for loving the world. We're part of the world. Thanks for creating us in your image. And we recognize that sin has marred that image. And that you designed something so wonderful, sending your Son, so that, again, through the power of your Holy Spirit, touching our hearts, we've been regenerated. We've been made new. Oh, oh, wow! We can say Jesus is Lord. We can live for Him. We can receive His love. 
We get to tell other people about it. Oh, that you would encourage us as we understand just a little bit more of the the truth of hell. We don't want anybody to go there other than the devil and his angels. So the good news about Jesus, as well as uh, the desire to take more people into the family of God, God, would you call people to yourselves, even today? Let today be the day of salvation. Don't let people fool around with time. We don't even know if we have time. We want to live today as if Jesus could come today. So help us toward that end, we pray. And continue to show us again the face of Christ who paid the price for our sin and we would worship him. To him be all the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let's sing, let's stand, let's sing. We do.
Do you know Jesus? It's where we, not, we need to start. And if you don't know him and want to explore a relationship with this one who is worthy, we'd love to walk alongside you. Talk to the person maybe that brought you or who it is that said, come watch, talk to me. And over coffee, Brian and uh, Sandy Richter have got that ready. Have some conversations if you need to around your table just to talk about Christ. He's worthy. He loves you passionately. My hope, my dream, may it be that the God of peace, the one who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that he would strengthen your inner being, right? To love him and to live for him for every good work. Tell people the good news. We don't want them to be eternally separated from God. And let it be that the blessing of God the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit, would rest upon you and work within you, dwell within you, this day forevermore. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Amen. Father loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. As we worship